Okay, welcome. This is the case lecture video for the Inray Clearpoint Chemicals case. This is a bankruptcy case uh, from the Southern District of Alabama. And it's a very recent case. This video is being recorded in October 2021. And this was uh, a case that was just heard uh, late this summer, uh, so just a few months ago. And it's a really interesting case because it entails uh, a discussion of creditor interests and the different types of creditors that are uh, contending for repayment and compensation in any type of bankruptcy proceeding. Um, so there's a lot to think about in these kinds of cases in terms of uh, who should get paid, who should get paid first, uh, how much they should get paid, and what kinds of disputes uh, or claims to valid arguments different types of creditors have in this kind of proceeding uh, when they're not happy with the arrangement that follows from a bankruptcy proceeding. So um, what uh, types of remedies are available to you if you're a creditor and you feel like you're getting the short end of the stick, right, in terms of the arrangement that uh, someone or some entity that is filing for bankruptcy may negotiate? Uh, because at the end of the day, a bankruptcy proceeding is ultimately about the circumstance in which um, the individual or entity filing for bankruptcy doesn't have enough money or assets to pay the bills. I mean, that, that is the essence, the definition of a bankruptcy, right? That they are illiquid, right? That they are, they're insolvent in the sense that they don't have the ability to cover their debt. And so somebody somewhere in terms of the creditors are, uh, you know, one or more people are not going to get all of the money that they had lent or was owed at some point, right? So the question is, what is a fair and equitable resolution to that kind of situation? And this is a, a dispute that every bankruptcy court and every bankruptcy proceeding must at some point wrestle with, right? There's always a little bit of negotiation as to uh, what is fair on balance between the various creditors. Sometimes there's only a few, and sometimes, as in the case with Enroy, uh, Enroy Clearpoint, uh, there are many. Right. But the question becomes then uh, what, again, is, is a fair balance of interests uh, involved here? And that's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Okay, so as we move forward, uh, there's one thing that we need to kind of lay out up front, and that is the different types of creditors that will be discussed in this case. Um, really, we're only going to distinguish between secured creditors and unsecured creditors, but I want to talk about what those terms mean and how they sort of lay against the, the landscape of bankruptcy. So when we're talking about secured creditors, there are really two types of secured creditors, but they're essentially the same basic idea. A secured creditor is a creditor that lends money or some type of asset, some type of value, right, to either a person or, or an entity uh, in exchange for the obligation to repay that value. And the difference, the reason why we call it a secured creditor is that their, their loan, uh, the, the value that they're lending is secured against some type of collateral, right? And it's usually property. And so one very common type of this is what we call a purchase money security interest. And the reason why that's the first item in this list is that you can think of this list as kind of a hierarchical order of priority for repayment, right? From, from any individual who might have a claim to a given type of property, right? So purchase money security interest is that the money that is being lent is the money that is being used to purchase the item or product or property in question, right? So for example, if you go to buy a car from a car dealership and the dealership agrees to finance the car purchase for you, that is a purchase money security interest, right? So they're lending you the money, but that money's not being used for you to then go on a vacation to Disney World. That money's being used to buy the car that they are selling you. Right. So it's a purchase money security interest because the money that they're lending you is being used for the purchase that they are negotiating with you. Right. The transaction that they are a part of with you. Right. And so that is always a first order priority security interest against any other lien on that property. Right. Because if you think about it, you could then apply another loan against the car as collateral from someone else. Right. You could go to your bank and say, you know, I need a car loan. I, I need a loan in general, you know, a personal loan and secure it with the value that is in your car. And if your bank is willing to take a second priority security interest in the car, um, they can do that. Right. There, there may be some value. Let's say that the car is worth twenty thousand. Right. And you agree to put ten thousand down as cash. 
Um, and then the, the dealership agrees to lend you the other 10,000. So that 10,000 is what we call a purchase money security interest right? That's a PMSI. That's a first priority loan because the dealership is giving you the money that you need to pay for the difference of the car uh, in financing, right? Now you could go to your bank the next day and say, hey, I have this car. It's worth 20000 And for the purposes of this discussion, I'm ignoring the tremendous depreciation that happens you know, as soon as you drive off a car lot. Um, but you could say to them, I have a car that's worth 20000 I just bought it. I've got 10000 in equity, right? Because you paid 10000 against the car and you owe 10000 to the dealership. But you could ask them for a loan against the remaining equity, right? You could say, I, I need a loan for the other 10,000 and you could have the 10,000 in equity in my car against it. And if the bank agrees to do that, then they also have a secured interest, right? They have a security interest in your car as collateral. So they're loaning you the money, but the loan is secured in the sense that if you don't pay it back, you agree to, to basically forfeit your car. Right now, this gets complicated when it comes to things like repossession um, in the event of defaulting on loans and bankruptcy, because, of course, the car can't be cut in half right? in, in the sense that, you know, half goes to the dealership and half goes to the bank. So whenever that happens, you then have to repossess the car. Usually it gets sold at auction uh, or, or whatnot. And then when that happens, the money that is tendered from the sale uh, is used to pay off the creditors, right? The people who have a secured interest. So in the example that we just talked about, that would be the dealership first, right? Because they have a purchase money security interest, which is always first priority. And then it would be whatever's left to the bank, right? And hopefully enough to cover everything, but sometimes not, right? And then if the bank has some balance left that hasn't been satisfied by the sale of the car, uh, then it would go into further proceedings as to whether or not they could apply a you know wage garnishment against you for the remaining balance or some other type of, of personal obligation that you would have to repay them. And they can try, but often it's difficult to do so, which is why security interests are so desirable because this allows whoever's lending you the money to have a clear title to recover their debt in whatever property it is in question, right? So this could be, again, a car we talked about. This could be a house, right? So we have mortgages and then we have second mortgages. Uh, we have reverse mortgages. We have home equity lines of credit, right? So there are all these different ways in which different creditors could have a lien against your property. But then the question becomes in the event that you default on one or all of them, who has priority, right? And so it's determined by the order in which the loans are taken, or again, if you have a purchase money security interest in the sense of, of real property, this would be your first mortgage, right? So the bank agrees to, to lend that money to you. So you, you have a security interest that is that are, that are hierarchical in priority, depending on the, the timing in which they occurred. Uh, and there's a number of different variables that go well beyond the scope of this lecture in terms of uh, discussing security interests in, in the law, right? It becomes immensely complex when you talk about, especially with re regard to things like real property and, uh, you know, real estate, homes and, and land and so on. Um, this can become very, very complex. Uh, but for the purposes of our discussion, the, the key thing that I want you to understand as we head into the rest of this lecture is there are secured creditors, which are those that have liens against some type of property, right? So again, it could be real property, could be automobiles, could be could be a dishwasher, right? You could go into Best Buy and uh, you know, or television. You could agree to buy an appliance and the store could say, okay, we'll finance it for you. Well, there you go. That's a security interest, right? And anybody conceivably that's willing to loan you money against that property you know, if your bank's willing to give you a, a secured loan against your TV or your dishwasher, um, then that's still a secured loan, right? In the sense that the property provides the collateral by which they should be repaid in the event that you default on the loan, right? They get to repossess that property that belongs to them. And so if we're talking about things like real property or even automobiles, there are ways to file those security interests, right? With the county recorder's office or the DMV, you know, if you've got a title to a car, but you've got a lien against that, that will be listed on the title. So there's there's filing obligations when it comes to things like real property and automobiles because those are the most common types of collateral. But in theory, you've got you know other types of collateral. Really, any property with value could be used as collateral for a loan. Right now, contrast this with the other type of creditor, which will be discussed in this case, the the Clearpoint Chemicals case, and that is the unsecured creditor. 
What does that mean? That just means I'm giving you a loan with no collateral specified, right? I'm, I'm not, I don't have any rights to place a lien against any property that belongs to you. I'm doing it on faith, right? With the expectation that you will pay me back. Now that doesn't mean I don't have a legal recourse to recover the money from you if you don't pay. It just means that I don't have any automatic rights to property that belongs to you. I have to then go to court and attempt to collect the money from you, you know, by way of a court order. Again, if you have it, they could take it from, you know, a bank account, or if you don't have it, I may have to garnish your wages or whatnot. So it's a, it's a little bit riskier in the sense that I don't have an automatic right to recover my value from property that is in your possession, right? So a perfect example of this is a credit card, right? If you have a credit card and it's not secured, which the vast majority of credit cards are not, there's no automatic lien against any property that the bank that issues the credit card to you has, right? They don't have a lien against your house for the debt on the credit card. They don't have a lien against your, your automobile. So if you don't pay that credit card, the bank certainly has a, a, a way of taking that into first collections. And then if that doesn't work, essentially taking you to court to force you to pay because you have a contract with them when you signed up for that credit card that says you agree to pay the balance. Right. So if you don't, you're breaching the contract and they have a, a means of through that contract taking you to court and saying you need to pay us. Right. And, and if you can't afford to pay, then you may end up going to bankruptcy, as was the case here with ClearPoint. Um, but the point of this introduction is just to elucidate the difference between secured creditors that have liens against real property or, or personal property, which, again, would be you know something other than land and, and homes, but really anything with value. Right, that there's a lien against that, that you're putting that up saying, look, I, I want to take this loan out and I'm providing this as an assurance that if you don't get paid by me, you then have ownership rights to this or some type of property liquidation rights to this right? to make sure that you get paid. So your secured loans generally come with better terms right? because there's, there's, better, there's insurance on the loan in the, in the sense of the collateral. Right? This is why your mortgage rates are, you know, for example, right now in the three to 4% range. Whereas if you go in and take out a credit card, what are you going to pay on that credit card? Probably 10, 15, 20% depends on the card and your credit score and various other factors. But the whole reason why a credit score is even relevant to a discussion like that is it because it speaks to your reliability to repay the loan, right? Because there's no other collateral to insure that loan. So why are the interest rates so much higher? Because there is no security interest on that loan. Right. It's a it's a I'm going to loan you this and I expect you to pay it back. And if you don't, the only means I have of recovering it is to take you to court, essentially. Um, whereas if I have a security interest in a home or a car, or, you know, whatever it is, uh, there's an easier means by which I can collect payment and, and recover the value of my loan if you don't honor our agreement. Right. So that is the necessary sort of pretext for this case as we move into what happened. Right. So speaking about a chapter 11 bankruptcy procedure, what, what does that look like? Now there's, there's two different, generally speaking, I mean, there's, there's many different types, but the most common types of bankruptcy are chapter 11 and chapter seven. Chapter 11 is what we would call a restructuring or a reorganization of debt and assets and the company itself, uh, or the individual in question, depending on the circumstances. So as to allow that entity or individual to continue with their operations and their activities in a way that would bring better value and return to the creditors than would otherwise be the case if they just collapsed in on themselves, right? Which is really what brings us to the other type of bankruptcy, and that's a chapter seven bankruptcy. Chapter seven bankruptcy is, is simpler by arrangement because it's just a liquidation of everything, right? So whatever you have, if, if you're an individual and you're filing chapter seven, you just you sell your house, you sell your car, you sell anything that has value until you're left with just a big pile of cash for whatever your, your, your net worth is. And then that is distributed to the, the creditors according to, again, their interests and a number of factors that we'll discuss in this case. But oftentimes a chapter 11 is better because a chapter 11 says, well, look, if we can reorganize the arrangement here in such a way where this company uh, or entity, which is most common, again, when we're talking about businesses, if we can arrange this in a way where this company could stay afloat right, and continue to do what it needs to do to operate, well, then it could continue to generate revenue. And if it continues to generate revenue and actually make a profit, then there could be a pathway to repaying what eventually might be most or all of the debt, right? At least a better circumstance than if we said, you know what, let's just liquidate everything. The company will fold and go out of business essentially. And then whatever's left over at the end of the liquidation is all there is, right? Because the company will cease to exist after that. There'd be nothing 
nothing left, no, no hope of generating additional revenue or profits to repay any remaining balances because the company doesn't exist anymore. It's a liquidation of everything. But chapter 11 says, well, look, if we can, if we can make the terms of the, the financial situation more tenable for this entity to then continue its operations and maybe recover from this, that might be better for everybody, right? If we can just negotiate, it'd be kind of like the thing of saying, you know, look, I'm a, say a tenant, you know, staying in your apartment complex. If you give me a few months of, of leniency on my, on my rent, maybe I can get ahead on my bills again and, and pay you back for everything that is owed in the rears, right? For, for the, 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 the time that you've allowed me to recover from, you know, whatever financial hardship is. Um, but if you say, no, you know, I'm just going to evict you right now because you're back paid on rent and, and I just, you know, I'm going to cut ties completely. Okay. Well, but you might not recover as much as you would recover if you worked with me, right? If you allowed me to renegotiate the terms of repayment in a way that eventually gets you back to whole again or close to whole. So that's the whole idea behind a chapter 11 is to try to fix the situation so that it's better for everybody, better for the company and better for the creditors uh, to which money is owed. So again, a company that wants to stay in business looks at a chapter 11. Uh, the debtor that will usually keep the property, meaning, you know, that whatever assets are in question, we're trying to retain those because the idea is we're trying to stay in operation, right? That's the whole purpose of this chapter 11. And the idea is ultimately to get a plan together that's as fair as possible for everybody, the debtor and the creditors, that allows that debtor to pay something less than the original, but more than would be paid ultimately if they were to just fold and liquidate everything, right? That's, that's the idea. Um, and, and again, the chapter seven would be the only real alternative. And usually, uh, that would be worse for all parties. So the chapter 11 is often looked at first, right? And, and only if there's no real feasible way of doing that, do you go to a chapter seven. <clears throat> so what happens in the sense of a chapter 11, we have ultimately a reorganization of debt, right? That's what we're looking at is how are we going to pay back bills? How much are we going to pay over what time frame in a way that's doable, right? For the business. So ultimately the debtor, the company that owes the money has the first opportunity to come up with that plan, right? To propose something to the creditors that is palatable, right? That they can, that they can tolerate for repayment, right? So they get to make the first proposal. And then the creditors are divided into groups that will be paid off in different ways, depending on the types of creditors they are. And this comes back to our discussion a few minutes ago about, are we talking with respect to secured creditors? Are we talking about unsecured creditors? Um, which different types? And it becomes, again, more complex than just those two groups. But those are the fundamentals of what we're really talking about in this context. Uh, the creditors for committees for each class uh, can negotiate on behalf of their respective group. And if they don't like the plan, they can try to negotiate to change it. That doesn't mean that they'll be successful, but they can always petition to try to negotiate a better position for you know, whatever repayment they're seeking. Because obviously they're looking after their own interest. We want our money back, essentially, right? Um, and then approval of the plan occurs if all classes are that are impaired by the plan, meaning you know essentially subject to the the circumstances, the creditors uh, vote to approve it, right? So they're, they're uh, and if not, um, as we're going to talk about, the the courts can um, essentially do what's called a cram down, which is to force the plan as long as uh, certain circumstances are met, and that comes into play with Clearpoint here. Um, so again, during the process, the debtor and the creditors uh, can continue to submit different plans, negotiate on different terms of, of timeline and total repayment amounts, uh, a number of variables, right? No differently than you would with a bank if you say, well, I, I want to you know, take a loan from you in the first place. Okay, well, what do we need to talk about? We need to talk about how much the loan is for. We need to talk about what the interest rate is. We need to talk about how long the loan is going to be uh, in, in effect. So are we talking about a one-year loan, a five-year loan, a 30-year loan? Uh, so there's a number of different variables. And the same thing happens with a bankruptcy renegotiation. <clears throat> and ultimately, if at least one impaired class approves the plan, meaning at least one of the groups of creditors involved is happy with it and signs off on it, the court can... Uh, again, affect what we call a cram down, which is to, to, to essentially the idea being you're, you're shoving this down the throats of everyone else, as long as they can substantiate that the plan is fair to everyone. Because here's the thing with bankruptcy, it's rare that you're going to get to a certain situation where everybody is in agreement, right? Somebody is going to get a short stick and somebody might get a shorter stick than another stick given to somebody else. That's always going to happen here because what is the basic 
premise of a bankruptcy proceeding. It's that the debtor doesn't have enough money to pay back everybody. So somebody is not going to get what they wanted or what they expected originally because that's the nature of bankruptcy, right? We wouldn't be in bankruptcy court if we didn't have that situation. So the, the idea that everyone would agree at the end of the day is hard to achieve. It's not impossible, but it's hard. And so the courts have a remedy by which they can force the plan to move forward as long as, again, you have at least one group that signs off on a plan and they can substantiate and justify the fact that the plan is fair, unbalanced to everybody else, even if they don't like it, right? So uh, if negotiations ultimately fail, in the end, if nobody can agree to anything, then again, you would go to chapter seven, which is, you know, the basic idea that, um, you know, that we're going to liquidate everything. And, and that's the, the, uh, the, the, the last alternative, so to speak. So what happens with ClearPoint? What are we talking about with respect to this case? Well, as of 2019, which is, again, just two years ago, ClearPoint was a profitable company having grossed over $50 million for that fiscal year. Uh, they lost a major account in 2019, uh, which was not good to begin with. But then in 2020, of course, uh, for those that are listening to this in, in the near term or have some uh, vivid memory of, of this difficult time for the world in general, uh, the COVID pandemic emerged, right? And so everything suffered, you know, regardless of industry, this was a difficult time for all businesses to sort of trudge through uh, as we negotiated the pandemic and the response and eventually the vaccinations and the struggle to get people inoculated from the effects of this and, and all the, the fatalities that have now reached in the millions worldwide. So this has been really, really difficult. But uh, insofar as ClearPoint is concerned, the COVID pandemic was the final nail in the coffin. It, it rendered the company insolvent, unable to continue to pay its bills and operate normally. So after the company filed for bankruptcy, uh, protection, its business continued to suffer uh, so, you know, things did not get better. So it's filing for bankruptcy, but while it's ongoing, you know, the, these things are only getting worse. Um, and at the time of, you know, this proceeding, we're estimating a negative net worth of almost $9 million uh, by August of 2021. So again, as I mentioned at the onset, we're talking about late summer of this year in 2021, um, $9 million in the red, right? Which means that if they just went through with a chapter seven and liquidated everything, they'd still be $9 million short of paying all their bills, right? So the question is under chapter 11, can we do better than that, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So its founders and major operators were two individuals by the name of Foster and Raider. Uh, they were accused of making fraudulent and preferential transfers while the company was falling apart. So there's some accusations of wrongdoing or bad faith uh, on the parts of Foster and Raider, which have a number of implications for, you know, suits against the, the owners and operators of these companies for, you know, essentially... Um, committing crimes and potentially negligence against the ownership interest of the company. Um, and so these allegations have not yet been brought as lawsuits because the bankruptcy proceeding was ongoing. Uh, after the petition uh, of bankruptcy, several plans were put forth. Um, and plan number three is what is before the court that we're talking about now, right? So again, a number of iterations, but we've arrived at, you know, the, the, the plan number three, it's, it's not really pertinent to our discussion here, what, you know, plans number one and two consisted of. Um, but you know, the, the bottom line is this is sort of the third iteration and this is what we're looking at as a potentially viable, uh, agenda to move forward with. So the plan to keep the company running, um, what does that look like? Uh, Foster and Raider, uh, the individuals managed to find a plan sponsor uh, that would finance the payout. So in other words, another company that would help to back this in exchange for some new ownership interest in ClearPoint uh, and obviously some advantageous arrangements on their part. Uh, the sponsor for the sake of our discussion was a company by the name of High Ground Holdings. Um, sponsorship was contingent upon, so obviously there are conditions to this kind of thing, it's not charity, um, a complete corporate restructuring and it would no longer be under the control of these two individuals, right? Which uh, to a certain extent is to be expected. I mean, if your company fails, then, you know, it, it, it may be expected that the executives and the individuals leading it will no longer uh, play a part. So, however, uh, key to this discussion is although no longer a control, Foster and Raider would get some benefits from the plan, which is kind of interesting and, and can smack of, of injustice, right? Because it's like, well, if you were helming this operation through the, the the failure period, why are you coming out with any benefits from you know the 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 plan that we agree to for moving forward? Um, 
but the the details of this foster would be off the hook for potential fraudulent transfers right so it kind of indemnifies the individual before the proceeding since the company would continue to operate and not seek to claw back that money right so there's an agreement not to pursue that claim um, but testimony establishes the possible actions against foster uh, were not clear shots in any case. In other words, so there's no smoking gun evidence to, you know, say, yes, they were absolutely fraudulent and we're just going to look the other way. It is, you know, this is a contested potential point of litigation. And essentially the arrangement here would allow that to be, uh, you know, that hatchet to be buried, so to speak, in, in the sense that it would not be pursued. Um, Raider, on the other hand, would get a 2% interest in the new company based on consulting services for the transition and the future operation of the business. So in other words, Raider would have a new business opportunity, 2% uh, interest and a consulting commitment, a contract to help with the transition to high ground and the future operation moving forward, right? So again, when you read that on its face, uh, it's common to see that as, well, that's unfair because this is one of the guys that was responsible for driving this into the ground in the first place. But the question becomes, is this person instrumental to seeing the company through to new leadership and new operations? You know, does, does this person have all the key information that's necessary to help it survive this transition? If so, then it may be a bitter pill that needs to be swallowed so that the company can survive in the first place. Um, and, and key to this is that it's not because of his previous contributions, um, but because of the value that is necessary and that he possesses in order to move this forward, right? So the creditors in the case uh, that we're speaking about. So the debtor submitted a series of plans through negotiation. Again, this would be clear point suggesting, you know, proposal to pay back the debts uh, Four classes of creditors. So again, we've talked about two main types, secured and unsecured. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it, it gets more complicated than that. Uh, there were three secured creditor groups, uh, which different priority security interests and in different assets, right? So I talked about purchase money uh, and other types of secured creditors that go beyond the scope of our discussion today. But for the sake of the proceeding, there were actually three groups of secured creditors that had financed the operations and then a fourth group of unsecured creditors, right? With no liens against any property or value that, that ClearPoint held. And all three plans proposed to pay the secured creditors in full, right? So every plan that was proposed agreed to cover all the debts owed to the secured creditors, right? So there wasn't a lot of objection on that side of it, but the unsecured creditors is where the issue comes in right? Unsecured creditors payments varied by the plan, right? So depending on which plan we looked at, one, two, or three. First plan would give them a million dollars divided proportionately, payments spread out over certain course of years. So again, this is part of the negotiation in any bankruptcy is how much do I owe you and how long do I have to pay it back, right? Because that ultimately determines how feasible the plan is in the first place. Um, the first plan would give them $400,000 divided proportionately paid immediately. Um, <clears throat> but would only be paid to debtors who voted to approve the plan. In other words, a gun to the head provision. So uh, if you don't agree and vote to approve the plan, uh, this doesn't help you. It doesn't provide any benefit to you. So this is why we call it a gun to the head is we're kind of forcing you to sign off on this if you want to have any benefit at all. Otherwise, if you petition it, you get nothing, right? And, and that's with respect to the second plan. The final plan would give them $750,000 divided proportionally paid immediately, right? So different terms with respect to different plans. Again, that second bullet point should say the second plan. So you have plan one, plan two, and plan three with different arrangements there uh, depending on the circumstances. <clears throat> And of course, the, the final plan key to this is that there is no gun to the head clause, which means you could potentially pursue uh, you know, an objection and a petition to this. Uh, you, you'd still be paid regardless of whether you approved it and signed off on it, um, which is important in, in these negotiations. So the resulting uh, transaction here, the three secured creditors all voted to confirm the plan. That should be no surprise because again, they were all paid in full under the plan on all three plans as it, as it turned out. The unsecured creditor class voted it down. Again, that should also be no surprise under plan three because there was no gun to the head provision in plan three. So there was no real penalty for doing so, right? So pursuing something better didn't hurt them in any way. 75% um, of the creditors in the class actually approved it in terms of volume of creditors. Right. But what's interesting here is that those who voted yes, those 75 percent actually only controlled about 25 percent of the debt that was involved in that class. Right. So if you have, you know, say four people just to make it easy and three of the four approve it, well, that's great. But if the fourth person has financed way more debt than the other three combined, then you have to look at it in terms of 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 debt 
proportionality as well as just volume of people. You can't just say, well, there's four people and three out of four approved it. Well, yeah, but when we're talking about actual dollars, if it's, you know, a million dollars and each of the three has financed, uh, you know, the, the three that approve it finance 50,000 each, and then the other fourth person has financed $850,000, the remaining balance. Well, now it's it's completely lopsided and it's not really fair to look at it just in terms of persons and, and hands raised to vote up or down, right? So you have to look at the entire context here. Um, so uh, under the rule, you need a majority of creditors and holders of two thirds of the class debt to vote yes for the class to approve it. Right. So this is the problem and why this plan did not get approved is that, again, you need a majority of creditors, meaning most of the people involved and holders that at least comprise two thirds of the debt. But this did not happen here. Right. You had majority of creditors, three out of four uh, or 75 percent, but you had only 23 percent of the debt. Right. Two thirds is 67 percent. Right. So you don't get there uh, in terms of the debt held. So this is why this was not approved. So the bankruptcy court approved the plan anyway, right? So ultimately moved forward with the plan. And this is again, where the cram down uh, rule or remedy comes in. So the bankruptcy court approved the plan anyway, through the cram down process. Uh, the judge again can do this if at least one impaired class approves the plan. And again, as we talked about, we had four classes here, three secured creditors and one unsecured creditor. And the three secured creditor classes uh, all approved it. So you actually had three out of four classes approve the plan and then only one class, the unsecured creditors, uh, not approve. So to confirm a cram down over the rejection by an impaired class of claims or interest, what do you have to do, right? What's required? There's a number of conditions. The plan has to satisfy all of the other requirements apart from the requirement that each class accept the plan, right? That's the obvious exception here that allows you to do this. So it has to meet all the other obligations of a successful bankruptcy uh, chapter 11 reorganization plan. It must not discriminate unfairly and must be fair and equitable with respect to each class of claims or interests that rejected the plan, right? So key to this, of course, is what is fair and equitable, right? We're using terms like unfair and fair, but these are certainly, I mean, to say the least, they're a little bit subjective, right? So how do we determine what fairness means in this context? And that's going to be pivotal to the analysis that the court did here. So what were the bases for the challenge from the unsecured creditor class? Well, the first was section 1129 of our bankruptcy code sets forth a long list of requirements for a plan to be approved, including that cram down provision. So that's included in the code. Um, the committee for the unsecured creditors argued five separate reasons to nullify the plan. In other words, five separate bases by which they felt the plan was, was not fair and should not be approved by the court. And so these are, are what they were. They argued that the plan was not proposed in good faith. Again, here's another nebulous term that is to some extent subjective. What does that mean? Good faith, right? The plan fails the liquidation test was the second argument. Third argument, there was no adequate disclosure. Fourth argument, the plan proposed unfair discriminatory treatment. And five, the plan violated what's known as the absolute priority rule. And we're going to break these down now in terms of why were they not found persuasive uh, by the court in question, right? So let's take a look at that. So the first element, good faith, right? What is the rule here? Unfortunately, as is often the case when we're litigating complex issues in court, a term is not defined right, by the code. So good faith is found in the code, but it's not explained. What does that mean? Right? And then it's really key to discuss this because it's pivotal to the argument being made by the, the creditor class disputing this plan. So instead, the plan's good faith is generally determined in light of what we call the totality of the circumstances. This is a term that's used a lot in, in the law. It just means looking at everything in context. Right? And so the bankruptcy judge is thought to be in the best position to evaluate whether a plan is in good faith. Right? So reviewing the totality of the circumstances to determine whether it was in good faith, there's a number of things that courts generally concentrate on, but they're looking at the plan itself and its ability to accomplish what you're after, right? which is a reorganization that serves to benefit everybody. Um, courts in the past have looked to whether the debtor intended to abuse the process. Right? Are they doing this? to to frustrate the purposes of those involved rather than in good faith right so denial of confirmation for lack of good faith in other words circumstances under which you would do this um, is appropriate when there's no realistic possibility of reorganization 
And it's evident that the debtor seeks merely to delay or frustrate the efforts of, of the creditors, right? So in other words, if you can find that this process isn't really being done in good faith, that it's not, there's no viable means by which this would actually work. And and the, the debtor, in this case, Clearpoint, is just trying to delay the inevitable and, and frustrate and kind of logjam the creditors into you know not getting their money, um, then that would be an example of bad faith that would compel the court to to deny the confirmation of the plan. Right, um, the focus is again on the plan itself and whether it will fairly achieve the result, which is again a reorganization that leads to a better situation for everybody involved. So, an allegation of bad faith again, the committee alleges the plan is proposed in bad faith. So, the unsecured creditor says this is bad faith. It's not. It's not beneficial to us, and we feel that it's being done in bad faith. So, the analysis. Uh, the discrepancy between the million dollars initially proposed to be paid over five years, that's plan number one, to $400,000, which is plan number two, right, we talked about, to $750,000 demonstrates that the plan does not comport with the debtor's fiduciary duty to, to the creditors, right? So what they're saying essentially is, look, there's no rational correlation between what's been proposed by the debtor, clear point, and what they owe us, right? They're not actually looking at what they're obligated to pay, they're just throwing stuff at the wall. And that's evidenced by the fact that across three different plans, you have three drastically different amounts, right? That don't seem to comport in any way with what they actually owe to us. So this is evidence of their bad faith. They're just just throwing stuff at the wall to see what might stick. Um, the substantial benefits afforded to the equity holders, Foster and Raider, is indicative of bad faith. In other words, the very fact that you are trying to uh, propose a plan that would benefit the people who drove this company into the ground is evidence of the fact that you're acting in bad faith. Why would they, why would they, or should they benefit at all if the plan is in good faith? And so in the last component, the gun to the head provision, which again was part of plan number two, uh, requiring unsecured creditors to vote in favor or not get any benefits at all, evidence is bad faith. In other words, it's coercion, right? They're saying that if we wanted plan number two, you're twisting our arms to approve it. Otherwise, we get nothing. Um, and so it renders the confirmation defective. Right? So looking at the analysis of these claims and the arguments coming from the committee, Lowering of the creditor's amount from a million to 750000 The court looks at it and says a definitive payment now may be better than the potential recovery of 33% more over a five-year term due to the time value of money and the risks associated with delaying the payment installments, right? So it may actually be better for them to get 750000 immediately than a million dollars over five years, especially when you consider, again, you've got inflation, so the value of money goes down. You got interest that would be factored into that over time as opposed to, you know, to carry that debt over a five-year period. Um, and also, the course of circumstances have changed. And, and obviously, Clearpoint is out of cash here. Uh, its assets, what it does have is continuing to decline, right? So the situation is not getting better. So there's an immediacy, right? An, an imminence and an urgency with which we have to act if we want to maximize value. And the sponsor, High Ground, isn't willing to pay any more than the proposed amount, right, involved here. And a court did not appreciate the gun to the head provision. In other words, they weren't a fan of that, which, you know, for obvious reasons, it, it feels like coercion and to a certain extent it is, but it held that it really didn't matter because the class voted to reject the plan anyway, right? So at the end of the day, it's a moot point because you decided against it no matter what. And we're only talking about plan number three here. We're not really talking about plan number two. So it's, it's irrelevant. The provision was not carried over to that third plan, right? So the gun to the head provision was removed. And so nothing has changed as a result of that, right? That they got rid of it and we're not really talking about the gun of the head because it's, it's moot with respect to plan number three, right? In terms of the benefits to the debtors, um, the court looked at it and determined it's reasonable for creditors who have accepted certain repayment terms to forego collection efforts absent further default, right? So it, it's it's expected, in other words, that if you agree to a plan or you're negotiating on a plan that you would not pursue collection efforts parallel to that, um, assuming that, again, the debtor, in this case, Clearpoint, does not continue to default on their loans and not repay according to the bankruptcy plan. So agreeing not to go after Foster is not necessarily unreasonable um, in the sense that, you know, they're, they're burying that hatchet in light of the new arrangement under the Chapter 11 plan that's been proposed. <clears throat> and although they may have had viable claims against the insiders related to preferential transfers, fraudulent transfers, unlawful distributions, and breach of duty, 
Uh, even if the potential claims against those insiders were pursued, there'd be no realizable benefit to the unsecured class, right? So in other words, what they're saying here is that, yeah, you may not like the fact that Foster and Raider are sort of getting off the hook under this plan, but the bottom line is that even if they pursued those claims for fraud and preferential transfers and all of the, the wrongdoings that have been alleged against those executives, and even if they won in court, it's not foreseeable that the unsecured creditors would get anything as a result of those lawsuits, that there would be any benefit for them either way, right? So their arguments about this being you know, pivotal to their decision, is it really falls on deaf ears because there's nothing there for them to, to see as, as realizable value, right? That they could conceivably think would be a benefit to them, even if that went forward, right? The money recovered would likely not have been enough to filter down to that class because again, you've got secured creditors that are paid first. Um, the sponsor explained that avoiding drama in rebuilding the business required holding off on going after Foster and Raider so that these claims could be held to be used against them if ever needed. So, um, you know, it, it's a condition upon which their cooperation is contingent, right? So in other words, the new company High Ground that is sponsoring this reorganization is saying, we are not going to make this uh, you know, a, a revenge mission to go after the, the, the past executives. Um, but we will hold it over their head to say, if they don't cooperate with us and help us under the terms of the new reorganization, we could use these claims in the future, right? We're not taking it off the table as a permanent uh, get out of jail free card, but we are saying that if you agree to work with us and help us to rebuild this business, uh, we will not, we will forego prosecution or pursuing of this litigation against you. So it's an incentive to get something of value for the company, right? That's the way it's looked at. And the compensation, again, of Raider was for future services, not past value, right? And so in that sense was irrelevant. <clears throat> in terms of key testimony, you have an expert witness here of which I've been a part uh, of numerous cases for personal injury lawsuits as an expert witness and as a consultant. So um, the key thing with uh, expert witnesses insofar as their testimony is concerned is that we are uh, unbiased and objective uh, experts that offer opinions on the facts for the purposes of helping the jury to understand the context of a particular concept that may be uniquely uh, accessible to us based on our background, right? So in my case, it happens to entail things like hospitality management, uh, operations in hotels and theme parks and restaurants, nightclubs, that kind of thing. Um, for the sake of Mr. Karakoff, we're talking about uh, bankruptcy uh, procedures and the the handling of Chapter 7 proceedings. Um, so Mr. Karakoff was hired by one side or the other, and he indicated that he did not consider this a situation in which the insiders looted the company to the detriment of the creditors, but rather they contributed substantial amounts to the company, had confidence in the success, and believed that Clearpoint was going to be able to pay its debts. So uh, Karakoff looked at the circumstances insofar as they concerned Foster and Raider and said, look, you know, I've, I've examined their actions here, and I don't see that they took advantage or exploited the company for their own personal gain. Now, it's very common in litigation that you'll have you know, experts on both sides that will offer contradictory opinions depending on the way they see the facts of the case. Um, but this was instrumental in so far as the perception of what Foster and Raider and their behavior and their actions were concerned to the case meant, right, in, in, the, in the total context um, was that, you know, you had an expert who at least looked at the situation and said, I don't see, you know, that there's a, a big smoking gun here uh, to go after these individuals for something nefarious, right? That it's debatable at best, right? Foster had worked very hard to arrange the current plan sponsor, right? So this was something that Foster had done to try to help the company survive. Uh, he tried to market the company uh, and had met, in fact, as, as the uh, evidence in the case suggested, with over 30 different parties and engaged in significant discussions with three different ones, but nothing led to a binding offer until they met with High Ground and they finally found High Ground to sponsor the reorganization. Um, and further, if the plan, plan number three, was not approved, it was likely that this would end up as a failed chapter 11 going to chapter seven, and that would be worse off for everybody, right? Because all you'd be doing is liquidating the assets and you'd still be $9 million in the red, right? As we discussed earlier. So that that's not as good a plan as, you know, any of the plans that have been proposed under chapter 11. So the liquidation claim, right, from the Committee of Unsecured Creditors as to, you know, another reason why this should not be confirmed. Um, this is also known as the best interest of the creditors test. Again, uh, Section 1129A7 of the Bankruptcy Code 
states with respect to each impaired class of the different classes of creditors. And again, we have three secured creditor classes and one unsecured creditor class here. Um, each holder of a claim of interest of such class has accepted the plan or as is the case here for the unsecured creditors, will receive or retain under the plan on account of such claim or interest of property of value uh, as of the effective date of the plan that is not less than the amount that they would so receive or retain if the chapter seven went through, right? So the idea is you have to either accept the plan or the court needs to be able to perceive in good faith that if we went to chapter seven and liquidated everything, that that class would be better off. Right? And if the court can say in good faith, honestly, sincerely, that the classes, even if they're rejecting the plan, would be worse off if they denied the plan and let it go to chapter seven, well, then clearly that's a, a grounds for confirming the plan. Right. So this is the case with respect to the unsecured creditors. No, they don't agree to it, or at least we don't get enough of the debt proportionality to agree in the unsecured class. But it's quite clear that if this claim, if this bankruptcy proceeding went to chapter seven, they'd be worse off. They probably would get nothing. Right. So that's a big problem. And so if the court can look at the circumstances and say, yeah, it's probable that they would be better off with the plan. Uh, chapter 11 plan proponent has to prove that each rejecting claimant in an impaired class will receive no less in the chapter 11 than the claimant would have received if the debtor were liquidated in chapter seven, right? They, they can't be worse off than a liquidation, right? So it was essentially undisputed in this case that liquidation of Clearpoint uh, would not produce enough to filter anything down to the unsecured creditors, right? So in other words, again, they're 9 million in the red at this point. And if we just liquidated everything and started paying off the secured creditors, there would be nothing left by the time we get to the unsecured creditors. So the difference between plan three of the chapter 11 uh, proceedings and this chapter seven liquidation is effectively $750,000 to the, the unsecured creditors, right? Because that's the amount that they would get immediately under the plan. So it's that or zero. And so you can clearly see a benefit to pursuing the chapter 11 and the cram down essentially. So they'd have gotten nothing under the liquidation plan. The only change they'd have in a liquidation was the fraudulent and preferential transfer suit against the insiders, right? Again, they, they'd have the option to pursue that, but the, again, not likely that anything would come of that for them. There would have been high administrative expenses for a lawsuit, right? And even assuming that they got recoveries from those claims on the higher end of expectations, it still wouldn't likely yield a dividend to the unsecured creditors that was better than what they were being offered under plan three, right? So even in a best case scenario, they would still be worse off. And that's the key with respect to that one. The adequate disclosure dispute, right? This was another claim under the committee for the reasons why this plan should be denied, that it shouldn't be crammed down their throats, right? The proponent of the plan under the adequate disclosure rule has to disclose the identity of any insider that will be employed or retained by the reorganized debtor and the nature of any compensation, right? So there has to be transparency with respect to the insiders and what they're going to be doing before and after the plan. Foster and Raider were undoubtedly insiders, right? There's no disputing that. Um, but in the new company, neither Raider nor Foster will maintain any direct interest in the reorganized debtor, right? In, in Clearpoint, they would have no direct interest. Neither Raider nor Foster will hold any management or executive positions, right? No official capacities in Clearpoint after bankruptcy. Um, it's admitted that Raider will have a small, less than 2% interest purchased for him in the new company. Uh, he won't hold any personal individual interest in the reorganized debtor, and he doesn't have any employment or compensation agreement with the debtor, right? So the, the disclosure as interpreted by the bankruptcy court in this case, uh, made by Foster and Raider was previously stipulated to its adequacy. In other words, it had been agreed upon that it was, it was disclosed and that it was transparent. Um, even if the absence of more detailed information concerning Raider's interest is considered deficient, the court concluded that it would be harmless, that it's ineffective, that by virtue of being a moot point, um, as a practical matter, let's say that they had gone into more, you know, more detail, more intense detail with respect to that, uh, the nature of the relationship, um, and, and that it would have caused other unsecured creditors to reject the plan, the result would have been the same, right? Because ultimately the unsecured class rejected the plan, right? There's no disputing as to whether or not it would have changed the vote because an argument about disclosure having been inadequate and that if disclosure had been more adequate, the vote might've been rejected doesn't make any difference because again, 
the vote was rejected to begin with, right? The plan was rejected by the unsecured class, so it doesn't change anything. Um, the court simply doesn't find that under the circumstances, further disclosure or noticing is required or that the disclosure is inadequate. Because again, for the reasons we just discussed, it would have been a moot point. It wouldn't have mattered, even if they were deficient. <clears throat> So absolute priority, what does this rule mean and how does it relate to the claims being made by the committee? So section 1129 uh, provides that the plan must, <clears throat> with respect to a class of unsecured claims, which is what we're talking about, that fourth class of unsecured creditors, it has to provide that each holder of the claim of such class receive or retain on account of such claim property of value as of the effective date of the plan, equal to the allowed amount of such claim, or so either they get what they're claiming is owed, or the holder of any claim or interest uh, that is junior to the claims of such class will not receive or retain under the plan on account of such junior claim or any interest in property. <clears throat> and this is the absolute priority rule because it requires creditors to be paid in full before any lower priority participant, such as an equity holder, may share in the assets of the reorganized entity, right? So essentially what this is saying is that you're not allowed to pay your owners anything out of a bankruptcy proceeding before you've paid your creditors, right? If you owe debts to external creditors and that debt is legitimate, right? That it, there's no disputing the, the sincerity of the debt that it's actually owed. You have to pay every dollar of that before, as we say, equity holders or ownership interest in the company um, gets any uh, benefit from the bankruptcy, right? To the extent that they would get zero before any creditor would walk away short of what is owed to them, right? That's the absolute priority rule. And the same applies with respect to the order of security interests for the differences between secured creditors and unsecured creditors, right? So as we talked about earlier, there's a reason why the plan requires in all three iterations that the secured creditors are paid first, right? Because they have a higher priority security interest than the unsecured creditors. The unsecured creditors, by definition of being unsecured, don't have a claim, a lien in any type of property or asset belonging to Clearpoint that would entitle them to priority over the secured creditors, which is why secured creditors are paid in full under all of these plans. And then there's just a dispute about the unsecured creditors with respect to how much is owed to each and how, right? <clears throat> so the absolute priority analysis in the case, Raiders 2% in the new company violates the priority rule, right? So what they're saying is, okay, we're going to get a short stick, meaning we, the unsecured creditors, we're only going to get a portion of what is owed to us, right? Meaning, again, plan number three stipulates $750,000 immediately, which is some dollar amount short of what is actually owed to pay all of those creditors in full. So what the unsecured creditor class is saying is, how is it that you're going to pay Raider in terms of a 2% interest in the new company, right? An ownership interest that, that he will walk away with, when we haven't been paid in full, does that not violate the absolute priority rule under the bankruptcy code? But, and this is key in the interpretation of the court's analysis, there's an exception to the rule when the junior claimant makes a cash infusion, which is necessary and substantial to the debtor. Right? In other words, if there's a claimant, a creditor that is subordinate to the claimant that is pursuing the claim, right? Whatever it is, in this case, the unsecured creditor. But that claimant makes a cash infusion, makes a contribution that is necessary and substantial to the, to the survival of the debtor, right? They're, they're making some type of investment in the debtor um, that is vital to that debtor's continuation of operation. Then that provides a method for allowing things to proceed, right? This is necessary to allow encouragement of financing of the troubled company. Right? If, if we didn't allow for this to happen, then no one would step forward, including Raider, including High Ground, right? any company that might attempt to bail this company out and allow for it to continue right? in the sense that it would have uh, some operation on which to base its repayment, right? on which to, to finance the repayment of all the creditors. Uh, if we didn't allow for this to happen, there would be no foreseeable way by which any such company would ever be bailed out of their operations uh, or their, their difficult financial situation. And they'd essentially all just be funneled into chapter seven bankruptcy, right? So as a matter of policy, so that companies can survive in the first place, this has to be considered, right? And so the court analyzed in looking at the situation, Raider will not have a direct interest in the reorganized debtor um, under the, the, uh, the terms of the plan. The interest that he does have will not be given on account of his claim or interest in the debtor, and it will be for new value tendered on his behalf. 
right? So the 2% value is not for something that, that existed prior to the reorganization. It's actually as repayment for his future services in consulting and helping the company transition to new ownership under high ground, right? So it's, it's a future transaction uh, compensation, not a past equity compensation, right? Which changes the context of that 2% value. It's based on Raider's individual skills and relationships as a good business development person and an anticipated consulting arrangement, which would likely benefit the reorganized debtor, right? The reason they're keeping Raider on is that they're seeing his skills, his abilities, his relationships, his connections as essential, right, to the survival of the business moving forward. If they're going to survive this bankruptcy reorganization and bring themselves back into the black, they're going to need Raider's help, right? And so the 2% investment interest is compensation for the help that he's going to provide in the future to help that transition move forward to make it happen, right? The court can't force him to do that by virtue of charity, right? Lest they violate, you know, slavery clauses, essentially. Um, so it is necessary that they bring him on for this purpose and the compensation is that ownership interest, but it's a future interest, not something that they're being, uh, that they're awarding to him from their, their past relationship. <clears throat> and then finally, the fairness and non-discriminatory treatment component of the argument, right? So this is the, the cram down, the idea that uh, whenever you, you hear this term, it's easy to think about, well, you know, somebody is being forced to accept the terms of an agreement that they're not happy with, right? Cramming this down the throats of the people that don't agree to it. In this case, we're talking about the unsecured creditors, right? So as we've discussed under the bankruptcy code, a plan may be confirmed despite the rejection by an impaired class if it meets what is commonly known as the cram down provision of the bankruptcy code, which again states if all the applicable requirements, everything else we've talked about in terms of liquidation and absolute priority and good faith and so on and so forth, right, that all of that is met, the court on request of the proponent of the plan, which would in this case be the debtor and, you know, perhaps even the secured creditors that voted it forward, uh, shall confirm the plan if it does not discriminate unfairly uh, and is fair and equitable with respect to each class of claims or interest that is impaired and has not accepted the plan, right? So again, we come back to these terms, unfair, fair, equitable, what does this mean? And once again, it's a little bit ambiguous in the legislation, which leaves it open to interpretation by the court. So when is a plan fair? What does that actually mean? A plan unfairly discriminates, according to the code, when it treats similarly situated classes differently without a reasonable basis for the disparate treatment, right? So we're getting sort of a crossover between, you know, any other type of anti-discrimination legislation if we're talking about the Civil Rights Act and Title VII or Title II, right? We're talking about unfair treatment without any reasonable basis, right? So what does that mean in the context of bankruptcy and how do we determine when it's present or absent? Right? The pertinent inquiry is not whether the plan discriminates, but whether the pros, proposed discrimination is unfair, right? So we're, in other words, we're not disputing that the plan before us is discriminating in the sense that it's treating secured creditors different from unsecured creditors and that the unsecured creditors are in fact getting a lesser advantageous position in the bargaining, right? They're, they're not going to get as much value as the secured creditors. But the question is, is that unfair? Does it make sense or is it unfair under the basis of the plan? So to be allowed under the bankruptcy code, discrimination must have a reasonable basis. <clears throat> the plan must be necessary to consummate the, 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 uh, the, the discrimination must be necessary. In other words, unavoidable to compensate the bankruptcy plan. And it must be proposed in good faith, right? So again, we, we're coming back to more terms. It's almost like we're dancing in circles around, okay, what does good faith mean? We're back to that again, right? We discussed earlier in our, in our uh, overview. And it must be in direct proportion to its rationale. Right. So it must not be overbroad to the extent that it's minimally necessary to allow the plan to move forward. Right. They, they shouldn't take advantage for the sake of taking advantage, in other words. So when we look at the analysis of the plan in the context of, of this case, all unsecured creditors are classed together as they are all similarly situated in status and priority. There's only one class of general unsecured claims, and they are all treated similarly with respect to each share in the distribution of the class on a prorated basis. Right. So what this is essentially saying is that all the unsecured creditors are in one class together and they're all being treated the same. We're not disputing between, you know, this unsecured creditor and that unsecured creditor. Now, with respect to the difference between secured creditors and unsecured creditors, that's the basis for this is 
quite clearly uh, based in in the the logic of priority interest uh, that exists, right? So the committee argued that the plan discriminates because it proposes to pay 100% of secured claims when their collateral may be worth less than the associated debt. Um, In other words, some of their debt may be unsecured and yet it's still getting 100% paid. So they're saying, well, you know, yes, you have a security interest against, uh, you know, let's let's just say, for example, a building or a, a vehicle owned by Clearpoint, right? But if we liquidated that in Chapter Seven, you wouldn't have gotten your full money back because the value of that asset is no longer worth the value of the debt that you're carrying against it, right? So the committee for the unsecured class is saying that's not fair because you're you're reaping the benefits of something that would not have worked out in your favor to this extent, if we had gone to chapter seven liquidation, you're getting full repayment for your secured debt, even though the, the, the assets that are the basis for your security interest are not worth that anymore. Right. And, and I mean, that's an interesting argument when we think about it, but due to the nature of the secured creditor's interest, there's a reasonable basis to treat the secured claims differently than the unsecured claims right? That this is not outside the scope of precedent or bankruptcy proceedings. The testimony established that the secured creditors hold liens on the debtor's balance sheet assets, which are necessary to consummate the plan, right? That, that this has to be the case by virtue of the fact that, again, secured interests come in priority over unsecured interest in every bankruptcy proceeding ever, right? So this is not to say that, um, you know, as an analogy, if you were to look at, you know, discrimination under, say, civil rights, you say, well, they're separate but equal. You know, we're, we've got one class of, of you know, white people and one class of black people that we, we know that that's unfair. But what we're saying here is that there's a reasonable basis by which we m- must treat the secured interest, the secured creditors different from the unsecured creditors, to, cr- to treat different types of unsecured creditors uh, differently within the class would probably be unjustifiably unfair or in bad faith or, or unjustifiably discriminatory, right? But they're not doing that here. The only distinction is the distinction between secured creditors and unsecured creditors in terms of priority for repayment. So the conclusion under uh, the court here, other objections were dismissed. Um, essentially looking at the basis for the claims coming from the unsecured creditors. Uh, Testimony in the case established that the sponsor's offer was hard to come by and not easy to replicate. In other words, high ground coming to the table. They had a unique position and a unique proposition that would probably not come again. So there was an opportunistic motive for wanting to pursue this while they still could. Showing that this was not a traditional sale of the company, which would have normally required a fair auction. This was uh, a sponsoring of the reorganization. Some out-of-date and irrelevant information um, disclosed earlier did not prejudice the unsecured creditors and that this was not grounds for rejection of the plan. And in any case, the unsecured creditors lack the standing uh, for challenging much of the disclosures, because again, for the same reasons we've discussed in numerous components of their arguments, they rejected it anyway, right? So they can't argue that something else, uh, illusory might've changed their decision because their decision was to reject the plan no matter what. And it still moved forward by virtue of the cram down provision, right? So all of that becomes moot. So thus the plan was confirmed, right? So this is the ultimate conclusion from the, the clear point case. Uh, it, it is fair and justifiable to treat secured creditors and unsecured creditors differently. So long as again, you can reach a basis of moving forward, even if it's not with the consent of every party, because again, as you've seen here and how complex this case was, it's really difficult to get complete buy-in from everybody because under the nature of a bankruptcy proceeding, somebody is going to get a shorter stick than they would like to get, uh, coming out of the, the plan. Right, but the ultimate tests are: Can the court uh, f- first do we have buy-in from at least one of the impaired classes, the creditor classes, that allows it to move forward? And can the court justify, on the basis of everything else we've discussed, uh, liquidity test, the uh, absolute priority rule, good faith, right, throughout the process, non-discriminatory treatment, or at least discriminatory treatment that is not unfair or unreasonable, uh, that it can move forward? And in this case, it was. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next time for another great case lecture video. Take care.